Good afternoon. Good. Yeah, Dolly, rub your hands together. Okay. That's, she's not doing that from warmth. She's doing that in anticipation. Um, my name is Sheldon Smith. I'm your education director. And uh, I introduce all the seminar speakers. And this one is like a, a lot different than our other seminar speakers. Uh, a lot different because of when Chris and I met Lisa. A lot different because of the first time Lisa spoke for a couple of minutes and all the women in the audience harangued me afterwards to make sure that she came back on her own the following time. And all the times that Chris and I would meet with Lisa and say, if you don't put this down in a book, you're crazy. Because the stories that Lisa told Chris and me on the record and off the record, and every time she got done, I'd go, could she have really done that? And I'm going, yes, yeah, she did. She did that. She did things that the guys would want to do because she was a photojournalist in Czechoslovakia when the Russians invaded. And she did things like directing TV shows. She's a nominated Emmy director. Jean Gobranson has written two books, and Jean lives in, where do you live exactly? Is it, is, Across the street from Lisa. Well, that part I know. OK. So, so Lisa moves, well, how long ago did you move? A year and a half ago? Uh, yeah, in that house two years. Okay. So Lisa moves, and Chris and I have been chasing her up and down the street going, write a book, write a book. You need a ghostwriter. You need a ghostwriter. Write a book. Lisa moves, and the woman across the street writes books. And I think the word in the, in the dictionary is serendipity. And so now they get together, and they start doing this book. And about, I'm guessing, four or five months ago, when they were in the galley-proof final stages, they had Chris read the first two chapters when we were in, what's the name of the pizza place? Metro, Metro Pizza Place. And Chris's food got cold, and she just ended up laughing and turning to Lisa, and laughing and turning to Lisa. And I sat there eating everybody's pizza, because Chris didn't put down the first two chapters of the book until she was done. Um, I don't want to belabor this a long time. Um, Jean, you're going first, right? Jean's going to go first for a little while and tell you how this came together. And I know everybody in the room, Chris and I feel really extraordinarily fortunate to have met Lisa that first time because although she isn't that old, <laughs> Lisa is the history of Las Vegas from the very, very early days. I'm not talking about the 30s and the 40s, folks. But I'm talking about the first time, if you're familiar with Minsky's Follies that came to the Dunes. Lisa predates that in terms of being the first nude. That was good. That was a good. Like that was that. a good. That was a good say. The first nude showgirl. And if you ever see Lisa's car, her license plate is first nude. And without further ado, Jingle Branson, the co-author. Co Ooh, you're doing it just right. We like the applause. Yeah. I don't know how this happened. I don't know how Lisa and I got connected. And it has to have been serendipity or some devil that leapt upon us. How many of you know where Sun City Anthem is? Okay. For those of you who don't know, Sun City Anthem is high in the hills in the south of Las Vegas is actually Henderson, and it's a 55 and older community, and it's quiet. It is so quiet that if two cars pass in 30 minutes, we think it's a parade. <laughs> okay? It's quiet, and it's peaceful, and it's conservative looking. And we moved up there. Close to my retirement, I was a corporate executive and a writer for 25 years, and and I was ready for quiet. And then a new neighbor moved in across the street. We didn't see who it was, but we saw the car. And as Sheldon said, the license plate said, 1-S-T-N-U-D-E, first nude. My husband and I said, no, that can't be right. I mean, who in their right mind is going to drive around with a car that says first nude? You know? <laughs> this is not right. A couple months later, my husband and I are walking the puppy, 
and I see this woman in the yard, the first time I'd seen our new neighbor. Well, the first thing I saw were legs. I mean legs. She had on the shortest pair of shorts I have ever seen in my life. Her legs went from the ground right up to, they went right up all the way. And she's holding this solar light thing like this, looking at it. And I'm staring. I said, Bill, do you see that? Yeah, he says, she seems to be having trouble with her light. <laughs> I said, oh, please, honey. Look at the legs. I said, how'd those legs get in here? This is an age-restricted community. We don't have legs like that up here. I said, go over there. Go over there and find out what's going on and find out if that license plate says first nude. He looked at me. You know that deer in the headlights look? I said, no, no, go, go over there. But I'll be standing right here, watching. Because I'm not stupid, you know. So he went over there and he was there a very long time. I did not know at that point in time that once Lisa begins to talk, she talks like a chihuahua on speed, okay? <laughs> I didn't know that. I just knew this was a long conversation. So after a very long time, he came back and I said, so what's the deal? He said, I don't think I can fix the light. Oh. I said, you know, I appreciate what you're trying to do here, but come on, what's the deal with the first nude? Oh yeah, he says, that is what it says. She was the first nude showgirl in Vegas. Really? In Sun City? <laughs> he said, by the way, she wants to write a book, and I said that you were an award-winning author, so you should talk to her. I said, <clears throat> Bill, I write things about strategic visioning. <laughs> he said, it could be pre-visioning from where I'm standing. <laughs> I said, well, there you go, Bill. So Lisa and I met, and I heard a couple of stories. And five months later, hello, here we go. So that's how it started. And it's been a real whirlwind ever since. Because I did not know about Las Vegas. I didn't come from that world. I had only ever seen one show in my entire life and I was 19. And that's before they carted you all the time, you know. And it was the Tropicana. And I think I probably saw her because we checked the, the times and it lined up. But of course I paid no attention to her because in her show was Vasily Sulich. Vasily Sulich. That was 45 years ago, and I remember his name. I have two ex-husbands, I can hardly remember their names. <laughs> but I remember Vasily Sulich. So the first thing I asked Lisa when I met her was, Tropicana, did you know Vasily Sulich? Oh yeah, she says, I used to shave his back for him all the time. Oh. I said, Lisa, I didn't need to know that. That just has wrecked my whole image. I'm still in love with him, but kind of on a different level. They're calling her. You hear that? I'm in the tub. <laughs> OK. Well, you don't want to hear from me, because I, I do not have an interesting life like Lisa has. I just mostly sit at a computer. And I know you want to hear from Lisa. She's going to share some of the stories of some of the things she's done. And I'm sure that you're going to have a bunch of questions, and that's fine, because Lisa loves questions. If you can kind of save them up till the end, that would be great, because you don't want, when a chihuahua's talking, you don't want to interrupt it. It's not a good thing, okay? Now, we know, those of you who know the title of the book, you know that she likes to hear the applause. So let's bring Lisa Medford. Well, I'm back at the chip show. My God. The, I, you know, when I came here, there were dinosaurs in Red Rock. And I think you can always tell an old showgirl. 
I was at the Green Valley Ranch about a year and a half ago, and my girlfriend and I had been gambling, and we ate at one of the restaurants, and we started to get on the escalator. And in front of us were five women. They were, one was kind of heavy, with a very big polka dot, and she had the, the little postige on her head with the, with the blonde little curls, and big earrings with, made out of daisies, and I mean, she was like really big. And then with her with all these other old ladies. And they're, but they were kind of look nice looking, but they were old. So she's getting on the escalator last. The, the other ladies went first. And she's in front of us. And the girl with me was Jeannie Stevenson, who's in the book. And she was a famous new dancer here in Vegas for years. And we let them go first. So the, the fat one with all the noisy clothes on, she starts to get on the escalator. And you know when you're getting old. And all of a sudden, you hear this, Jesus Christ, I used to be able to dance up and down stairs naked with a feather coming out of my ass, and now I can't get on the escalator. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's, that's an old showgirl. And I think, to, but, you know, we still wear the big daisy earrings and funny stuff. And um, I realized there were a lot of them still here. But I was very surprised that a lot of them did not know the mob they were absolutely unaware of the mob. They were absolutely unaware of a lot. One girl told me she lives up in Anthem, Sun City. I asked her about what she remembered. She said, I was drunk for four years. I don't remember anything. And so I, luckily I still have a very good memory and a very, you know, I just photograph everything in my head like a video. And I think the, f the, f the first thing that everybody wants to know is how did I ever get here? I had been in a convent for 12 years in Catholic school. My parents are first generation Lebanese, so I'm the first one born in this country. And it's strict, really strict family. And I used to change, I have four sisters, but one of them wasn't born yet and the other was too little, but I used to change my bathing suit in the closet. That was how modest I was. I was, you know, just weird. I guess little girls are weird anyway. So. Here I am, 18 years later, 19 years later, standing on a stage in Vegas with duct tape <laughs> and sparkle. And I remember um, I had a, there was a model agency, and I was kind of doing some modeling, you know, pin up -y thing, you know, a little bit of, I think Playboy just come out. I did a little Playboy thing, but I wasn't the centerfold. So anyway, so... Um, this old man had the agency called Andy Anderson, and Andy had a heart attack, and he got sick, and he said, you know, you're the one that's the most reliable. Why don't you run this for me? Until I get better, I'll be in the hospital like about a month or two. I said, okay, great for me. I get all the good jobs, and this would be fun. So about five days after Andy went in the hospital, these two men walk in, the suits. They came in with overcoats and the hats, which you didn't see a lot in LA. And they're wearing their hats and big cigars. And it was Sammy Lewis and Danny Dare. And they were putting on a show with Harry Belafonte at the Riviera Hotel. And a law had been passed in Vegas that they could have nudity, topless. Up to that time, there had been a few strippers, like maybe at the El Rancho or someplace, but they were strippers. They came in for, with their own show, like Lily St. Cyr, I think was one of them. And, but nobody, there were no nude showgirls. And they said, we're going to break the law so you can be the test dummy of boobs. So that's what I was. I was the crash dummy. So it took a while. We went through magazines, and I wasn't going to do it myself. So I found a girl that looked like, if you remember the old actress, Anita Ekberg, she was like six feet tall with big boobs, and she was gorgeous. And uh, found this girl and couldn't find another one to match. So now it's like, I guess it's about t three nights before the show is supposed to open, and there is no showgirl, no two identical showgirls. And we sat there, and they're going, let's go through the pictures. We had pictures of old people, young babies, fat. Everybody was sending their pictures in to do this job. And uh, finally, we're sitting there at about 3 o'clock in the morning in a little tiny room with cigar smoke, and I, I'm tired, and I want to go home, and they're freaking out about the show. And come to find out, the guy looks at me, Sammy Lewis, and he said, Hey, kid, he said, you got any tits? And I go, oh. <laughs> I said, of course I do. And he goes, well, let's see them. And I go, no. He 
goes, let me just see your tits. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. We've got a show to do. So I go, okay. <laughs> right? And he said, good. Now let's go through the pictures and find someone that looks like you. And that was it. The next day, I was on my way to Vegas. And not until, I think it was the 40th anniversary of the Tropicana, the Folie Bergere. They had a big 40th party. Is when I ever really realized that I, that I did have a great history here. You know, you forget. And they called everybody's name to come up on stage. And I heard the applause. And I was going, oh my God, all these people remember me. And then I remembered all of them. So that's how the book started, and that's how I started. Um, I had, I think the funniest part of Vegas is actually doing the show. The audience does not understand that you can hear them and see them. I can see the way past the back row in a dark room because the lights, you still see the person, and even up to the tenth row you can hear their conversations. And they would come out with the weirdest stuff. I remember at the dunes one night, we had, we had these costumes that were like little nightgowns with little caps, like the French Revolution, and we'd go through the audience and scream, ah, you know, like Napoleon was there. So the, all the troops, they had horses on stage, and they had cannons, and things were blowing up, and we were running around in little nightgowns. It was like so stupid. So anyway, but, but it's kind of fun, you know, but it was stupid. So at the end, when they have the crowning of Napoleon, we have these huge costumes. Well, there were two couples sitting in, like, King's Row, which would be, like, for the, for the big rollers, but not the booth and a table. And through the whole show, they're going, my tits are better than her tits. <gasps> Look, he's a fag. They're all fags. And all the women are transvestites. And they were going, you could hear them through the whole show. And the dancer, the guy dancers could hear them. And we're going, we go back to change clothes now for the crowning of Napoleon. And everyone's going, oh, what assholes? Do you believe these people? They're so stupid. And so we're all mad. The whole company, 100 of us, were furious. So we have to come out on this runway. And there's the tables. The tables are right there, the two, the, four cup, the two couples. And we have this cape that was all steel. The whole high back on it was metal with stones. And the cape was about 80 pounds. It took two women to hold it, to get it up on you, and a hook to hold it. And the whole lining of this heavy velvet was in heavy visqueen plastic, which made it even heavier. So as we walked down the ramp, and we got to their table, we turned the capes, and the other girls were coming the other way, and they turned their capes. The women's wigs fell off, the drinks went all over the floor, and we just kept looking down, and we'd smile at the table. <laughs> so be careful if you're watching a show. <laughs> they'll pick you out, and they'll get you wet, or they'll drop the tiger on you, they'll do something. And uh, it was, it was um, the stage part was the most part, and there's nothing like an audience. There's nothing like doing the show for so many days and weeks without a day off, and then all of a sudden you're so tired and you think you're not going to be able to do the show that night, and you put on your makeup and you go and downstairs and you stand behind the curtain, and just before it opens, you can hear the orchestra tune up, you hear the people, the murmurs of the people, and you see the cigarette smoke going up and the glasses are clinking, now you, there's no cigarettes, and it's a plastic cup. And you know, I, don't, I don't know how they do their shows anymore with people sitting in seats. But uh, it, it gave you the adrenaline. It was a rush. And it, you, you could go till 5 in the morning just on that rush. Back at the Tropicana, well, Tropicana was another whole story. We had bizarre costumes, to say the least. And there was a costume that is in my book, in our book. And, the hat, it didn't weigh much. The, the hat was a little velvet thing with these big tall feathers. And the dress covered your boobies and it was like off the shoulder. And it was velvet with all these beautiful feathers and each girl had different color feathers. And one hook held the whole dress on in the back. So one night, I, you know you kind of space out. You're not thinking about what you're doing on stage. You just hear, you hear beats of music and you just move. So one night, they say, Go, this girl's out, because sometimes they had hookers that worked the show. And if they had a guy, they wouldn't come back to do the show. So we'd take one girl off and move the rest of them around so we had an even number. So one night, one of the girls was doing her thing, 
And they moved me to this spot out where it's called a passerella, where the orchestra pit is down here, and then there's the runway that comes out from the stage, and it's lit up. That's where we got the people to dunes with the capes. So anyway, so they said, take this other girl's place. Well, I used to stand towards the back. I didn't stand up on this, this little passerella. So I'm standing on the passerella, and I am so cute. I'm just standing there, and I was just, oh, I'm so amazing. I'm so lucky. And I'm thinking, what am I going to eat tomorrow? Where am I going to gamble tonight? What am I going to have for breakfast? Do I want a scotch after the show, or do I want a vodka? And all of a sudden, people start laughing. I hear this, the group in front of me were giggling, kind of, a little tittering. Yeah. So I go, I wonder what they're laughing at. And I thought maybe my, my pasty had fallen out of my top. And I look down, and there's nothing there. And I go, Okay. And your hands are out, and you can't turn around to look behind you. You can't, turn, you can't know what someone's doing behind you. For all I know, someone's lying on their back out there falling apart. So now there's more people laughing, but I notice the rest of the, you know, the 700 seats. Nobody else is laughing, just this group. They're still snickering. And all of a sudden, there is a hand on my thigh. A man had, was drunk, and he crawled up under the hoop skirt. It was a big skirt with a piece of metal all around to hold it away from you like four feet. And this guy had crawled under my skirt and only his butt was sticking out. And everybody knew it in that section of the room but me. And I kicked him. I knocked out two of his teeth. He ended up trying to sue the hotel. Imagine you're sitting there with your mind eight miles away and there's this giant hand grabbing you. So that, that was that costume I hated. And I hated the spot. So a week later... Literally, I'm in the same stupid hoop dress. And I now am back at another spot. Another girl's turning tricks, and I have to go in her spot. So I go in her spot, and I'm supposed to step back. The curtain, we do the number, and there's an ugly, blonde, fat opera singer standing there singing some horrible song. And we just had to, we kind of move around like swans. You know, it was really awful. So I'm standing there, and I step back, and I take a bow. And I stand up, and then the curtain comes down again. Then the curtain goes up, and we take a final bow, and then the curtain goes down again. Well, the first bow, I take a beautiful bow, the curtain comes down. Now, there's also an iron rod in the curtain, and there's an iron rod on the hoop skirt, and I don't have to tell you what happened. The two met and fell in love. <laughs> and the curtain goes up, and I didn't step far back enough, and the skirt goes up and up, and it's higher than the ceiling. And I go, holy shit, I'm going to die in this stupid costume. And I, the, and I thought, all I could think of was unhook it. So I unhooked the one hook, put my arms up, and the dress went all the way up. My hat fell over my head. And I'm standing there in a homemade G-string that was dark blue with yellow ducks and a safety pin that big holding it up. And I took a bow, and I walked off the stage like nothing ever happened. And I don't know if anybody even noticed. I, it, it was like, I just, that was, I talk about it in the book. It's called The Dreaded Hoop Skirt. And I'll tell you one more story about a costume. Well, it's not a costume. I used to come out of the ceiling at the Tropicana. There were four of us, four girls. And Felicia Atkins was probably one of the most famous showgirls here in Vegas. She was at the Tropicana since the day it opened. And she stayed about 26 years, and they didn't hire her an audition. They sent her home. That's how she was fired. They never even came up to her and said, thank you, for 25 years. They just said, well, you two can go home, and you can go home, and the rest stay. So that's what happened when the hotels started getting big, you know, when they started getting corporate. They would never have done that with the mob. Anyway, um, which story was Oh, the ceiling. Okay. Oh, my. I think I need a... Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay. That I think was good how you edited that. <laughs> you know what they say? Your mind is the second. What? They say your mind is the second thing to go. Trust me. Okay. So now I'm coming out of the ceiling with this bevy of beauties. I've been coming out of the ceiling for years, on and off. And one night I'm up there with the mechanics, and I'm, I'm a little early, and the other girls aren't up there yet. And I always have, you know, I always like to know how things work. Uh, with my first husband, we owned a gas station, and he would work all day for my father, and I would run the gas station. So I would clean carburetors, and I could 
practically rebuild an engine when I was 18 and do lube jobs and whatever, tune up, minor tune ups. Those cars, they had a carburetor and a thing, and that was the end of the car. Now, I don't know how to put the key in right. So, so I'm, I've been coming out of the ceiling for years, and I was up there with the, with the guys that run it, and it was a long machine, and it had the pulleys, and we had, we had four wires that came down, like huge fishing wires, and a two-by-four that we stood on, a little plywood two-by-four, and a little thing behind your back, like a little bar to hang on to about, I don't know, they used to tell us that it was nine inches, but I guess that was a lie. <laughs> so, but it was a little bar. It was, it was a little bar, and in case of emergency, you could kind of hang on to the bar or lean on it, lean back on it, which I never did. I didn't trust leaning back on anything out of a little plywood. So I said to the mechanic, I said, what happens if it breaks? What if my, what if my thing breaks? He said, don't worry, they'll all break. If one goes, they all go. I said, oh, okay, this makes sense. So I get in the cage that night, and you had to crawl from the ceiling, you went up, and then the mechanics were up here, and there was a hole cut, square holes, for the girls to climb down a ladder, about seven steps into the hole, on the plywood, and it was flush, the bottom was flush with the ceiling. So then when the music started, they, they came out of the ceiling, and people would go, ooh, ooh, you know, really cool. So it wasn't cool for us, but it was, you know, cool for the audience. So we come out of the ceiling, and all of a sudden I'm in this machine, I, you know, I'm standing on it, and I just got off the ladder, and it starts going down, and it's shaking. It's starting to shake. It's hitting the sides, and it's shaking, and it's going down, but it's jerking and shaking, and it's creaking. And I, ha I go, should I tell the other girls to hang on, or should I just announce the show and screw them, let them fall and die? I, I, I didn't know whether to make an ass of myself. What if it didn't fall? It fell. The one wire came loose, and I heard a whew, and it was right past my face, and it was hanging. The right front one was hanging, and I'm tilted like this, out over an audience looking for the fat man. I needed somebody really, really fat. I'm telling you, it was, it's pathetic. And I, so I'm leaning over, and the guys are screaming, pull the wire in. Pull the, and so now I've got to make it swing so I can reach out and get the wire. Wrapped around my hand, they pulled me up manually. So every night was an experience, and so the, the next show, the girls wouldn't go back in the cage. The guys kept saying, we've got it fixed, and they said, we're not going in. So the stage manager said, Lisa, if you go back in, they'll go back in. Yours is the only one that broke. If you go back, they'll go back. And I said, okay. I said, 500 now and $100 every week thereafter for the run of the show. He said, are you kidding me? I said, you guys know what extortion is. That was it. <laughs> you work with the mob, you think like the mob. I mean, that's how you survive. So I got my $500 bonus and my extra money, and I was always happy. And it never broke again. But I, my girlfriend, Gloria Tiffany, who I've just heard from recently, she lives in France now, and she's moving back to Vegas. She was drunk and fell out of the swing at the Stardust and broke a guy's arm, so she got fired. But she's coming back, guys. We're still kicking, just not as high. Okay, does anybody have any questions about something else? Yes? When you first started the show, how much did you do? Uh, the first time, I think it was something gigantic, like 250 a week. 57. That's when you made about $135 a month, and your rent was about $50 a month. So that was good money. We, we always did, and the showgirls did better than the dancers, you know. I could have held them out for more because they needed the girls so bad. But when you're 19, you don't really know how to extort. <laughs> you know, I say, hey, the show opens in three days. How about 500? You know, they would have paid it. They'd have paid 1,000. But, you know, you live and learn. Now I'm not worth anything. I barely can get a dinner out of the guy. <laughs> My extorting days are over. <laughs> It's like a bargaining chip. You have nothing to ch trade with. Lisa, you used to tell us about how you made money that was off the books. Oh, yeah, we made a lot of money. That's how I belong at the chip show, because I stole more chips than you guys could collect in your lifetime. <laughs> Showgirls show girls stole chips, and it was called mixing. We had to stay in the hotel till 2 o'clock in the morning, and that was mixing. So what are you going to do when you mix? You get free drinks, so you sit and drink. And it, 
and listen to Perez Parado playing Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White all night for 30 times. So every so often, you walk by a table, or you'd sit at the blackjack table, and there's a guy next to you. You always kind of looked, the guy had the most black chips. You know, you kind of look. Ah, that guy's got a lot of chips. You stand next to him at the craft table. I always think he goes, oh, do you know how to play this game? And you go, no. And of course, you know, everybody knew how to play. So he said, oh, here, take some money. And they give you like $500 in chips. So you're gambling, and he's not paying attention, and you're palming. You're putting a chip anywhere that you can stick a chip, you got a chip. Then he looks down, and he goes, oh, you're out of money. And you go, yeah, I lost it. He goes, here, take another 500 Meantime, then you'd win. You'd win five or 600 and you'd pile those chips down there. If I had just kept those chips... What was I thinking? But we used to use them as legal tender. And I think until somewhere in the 70s in Vegas, you could buy your groceries, your gasoline, anything you want with chips. It was money. Now they don't take a chip for anything. You know. But in those days, I'd go to the Smith's Market and buy my groceries. I'd go to the Standard Station and pay with chips. And silver dollars, everybody got your silver dollars. You didn't keep those either. The problem with being young is you think nothing's ever going to end. You know, It doesn't really end, it changes. But Boy, if I had just kept those chips, I can't believe it. And how many ashtrays I trashed. <laughs> how many napkins did I wipe my lips with? I can't stand it. Yes? <laughs> right. That part of it, I can't think of one. Uh, sometimes little local casinos will, you know, like terribles, but it's so crowded and little and they're junky, you know, food's terrible. But it's true, Vegas was built like a pyramid. And all the money was in the casino. They gave away rooms for what, $10 a night, $12 a night. You walked in, you had a bottle of liquor, you had food, you had whatever you wanted. And the whole thing was service and, and, and relations with the customers. And you felt like the ceilings were low. I mean, the rooms were crappy, but you know what? They were right outside the door. You didn't walk down 17 hallways to get to your room. You just walked out to the pool, and there was your little room. And you could jump in the pool and go in the casino, and women dressed at night, and men dressed at night. They remembered you. If you didn't come for 20 years, they remembered you. Now, when the corporations took over, they had to make a profit on the olives. Make a, I'm, that's what killed Vegas. No music, no live music, and the olives. And then they had to make money on the gift shops. They had to make money in the coffee shop. They had to make money in the restaurant. They had to make money at their stupid buffet. We used to get chuck wagon for a dollar. And it was the best buffets, gourmet buffets for a dollar. And then they would fly junkets here. That's where their whales came from. They'd bring in the planes. And all they had on them were high rollers. They flew them in for free. They comped everything. They threw a few showgirls in, in the mix. And that was it. They would eat in the restaurant. We'd had four or $500 bottles of wine. Hotel picked up the tab. And now, when the corporations, who you're right, the biggest crooks of all, when they came in with Howard Hughes, and thereafter, Parvin Dorman, it was, it, you're a number. You're just a, you're a plastic card, and they don't care if you gamble, if you eat, if you sleep, and if you don't come at all. They make it on volume, and they make it on slot machines. You don't see $100 bills laying all over the crap tables anymore. Everybody's got a little card, uh, you know, a credit card. Before it was cash, and, and there were no taxes. Yeah. What are the big names? Howard Hughes? You know, my dad played golf with Howard Hughes early days, but I never met him. And Bugsy Siegel, my dad played poker with him, and I, he braided my hair one day. And he made one big braid and one little braid, and I told him he ruined my life. So, and I, I was, of course, Sinatra was here and Sammy Davis. And a lot of people played the lounges that are now bigger stars, uh, Don Rickles, Ronan Martin, Shecky Green. But, when when, but it was like a family.
because everybody went to see everybody's show at one time or another. Everybody would go hang out at the lounges. We don't have any more lounge shows. We'd all go to the lounge. It was not even had to buy a drink. And we'd, then we'd all go to breakfast somewhere at 6 o'clock in the morning, and there'd be 25 celebrities in there all eating pizza. It was, it was really fun. I, they were all here. Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, big oil guys like Clint McClintock from Texas. So they, and all the stars were here. Every, there were a lot more stars because we didn't have Cirque du Soleil and everything. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, I think he was a man with a split personality. I think he did a lot of charitable things for some people and didn't put his name to it. But when, you, when he did something bad, the press didn't put his name to it. He did... I don't, I don't remember in the book if I talk about the cigarette lighter. Uh, that's a true story. He was sitting behind, he was sitting next to a woman, and I was between him and the woman. He told me to come, come with him when he played blackjack. And the table was full. He sat down. Of course, everybody's crowding around. And he said something to her that I couldn't hear, but it wasn't nice. Kind of propositioned her. And she was just an average, attractive 28-year-old, 30-year-old woman. And she kind of shook her head no, like she wasn't interested. So he waited a few more minutes, and he leaned over to her again, and I could see she was really upset. He said something really nasty to her. And she got really, really freaked out. She sat there for a minute, and he reached over. He had a cigarette lighter. He had a gold Dunhill in his hand. And he reached over and said something really gross to her. And while she was getting upset, he put the cigarette lighter in her purse. And she got her purse and her chips, and she got up off the table and walked out. And he goes, security, she stole my lighter. Stop her. That's not a nice man. And um, I went back to security and said, let her go. He did it. And he said, I know he does this all the time. Uh, it's just, you know, the guy was a jerk. He was completely a jerk. And I, another time, another, what did he do? He invited some hooker to be with him for the whole weekend. And... We went to see a show at a hotel, and we're all sitting there, and I'm sitting across from him. And the hooker is next to him, and she was, like, kind of drunk and sloppy and pretty, but, you know, trashy. So he says, go get George. George was his valet guy. And George was at, standing in the back of the room with a drink in his hand. He said, get George. i got to get rid of this bitch. I can't stand it. Get, go get George. Go get George. And I said, hey, you go get George. He works for you. I'm not going to get George. Please, go get George. Go get George. So I said, oh, I'll be back. So I get up and I go back. I said, George, your boss wants you. He goes, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> and George wouldn't go either. George wouldn't go. Because he, he obviously knew what he, Sinatra was going to do. And here comes, five minutes later, two security guards. Now, this is his date. They picked her up by the arms and carried her out of the full packed room. And that's not nice. You know, when you take someone to a party, honey, you make sure they get home and not by security. So that was my, you know, and I had fights with him about stuff. We didn't get along too well. well he'd yell at me and I'd yell at him. Uh -huh. You got a question? Yeah. What? Go ahead. Oh, Steve went. Um, I guess it was in 1968 and I was going to get the divorce. And I just kind of had it in Vegas, and I had this offer to go to Czechoslovakia. Well, actually, to go to Germany and write for Germany, and that's where the money would come from, would be Germany. But I would be writing all over Europe about music. So, but I wasn't sure about selling the house or anything. And I'm home one day by myself, and I hear this little on my door. And there's this really nice-looking guy in a jacket, and really, I noticed men's shoes. It was like men with nice shoes, nice watch, and a nice butt. So you judge a man. So first the shoes, then the jewelry, then the butt. So I look at this guy. I couldn't see his butt, but his jewelry was nice. His shoes looked good. And I, and I go, yeah. And he said, hi. He said, uh, is your house for sale? And I said, and my house was now, well, I'll tell you where it was now. He said, um, I said, no, the house isn't for sale. And he goes, 
Uh, can I come in and look at it? Well, we didn't have killers. You know, my house had a swimming pool. You could swim in from the golf course, and I never had a, a burglar alarm. You could just swim in my house. You'd probably get shot, but you could swim into the house. So I said, sure. So I took him on the tour of this really beautiful house, and uh, it was facing the 17th hole of the Tropicana Golf Course. And he, he said, you sure it's not for sale? I said, no. And he walks out the door. And um, it's kind of where that bus stop is right now, across from Hooters, which wasn't there either. And he walks out, and he turns around, and he says, can I ask you what you paid for this house? And I said, I paid 60000 He said, okay. He said, what if I give you 160 and you carry my second for a year? I said, sold. So, but I should have known if he's going to pay me 160, what am I thinking? But it finally sold to the MGM for 5.6 million. That was Steve Wynn at the house. And uh, I've never seen him since. Oh, I saw him before he moved in, but I've never seen him again. I should have. I guess I should call him up and say, hey, I carried your second. You owe me. But <laughs> give me a job. Yeah. I thinking back on it, I think I broke my own. I, <laughs> I never wanted children. I came from a big family, and I never, I thought your life ended with children, according to what my parents said. You turn gray, and every bone in my body is because of my children. And, um, I started dating Cary Grant when I was married to my first husband. That's what ended the marriage. He opened the front door, and Cary Grant was standing there. So that took care of marriage number one. Um, Cary Grant wanted a baby. He was getting older. He was close to 60. And he said that if I had a baby with him, that I was, if I was three months pregnant, he'd marry me. And so I thought, oh, this is really a good idea, because I take birth control pills, which I did. The whole time I went with him, I never told him I took birth control pills. But it, uh, Diane Cannon showed up and did good. You know, she did all right. She made a few bucks on that one. And he ended up with a very beautiful daughter who's very sweet. I uh, wish she looked more like her dad than her mom. <laughs> so that was my Cary Grant story. We, he was an enchanting man. Absolutely enchanting, yeah. Just two. Last time, it's, it's been 30 some odd years since I've been married. I have a very nice cat. I have my own remote control. Nobody puts hair in my bathroom sink that isn't mine. <laughs> And nobody talks to me during a football game, so I'm very happy. You know what I have is one pasty, and I have, I don't know what happened to the other one, and I have a necklace and earrings from the Tropicana. What happened was, they, all the costumes were handmade with sequins and rhinestones, and when the show ended, they burned them. They had the... Um, Immigra not immigration. I keep thinking of immigration for is on my mind. The uh, tax people, the IR not the IR IRS, customs, the customs department would come in, and if, the, if they wanted to keep the costumes, they had to pay heavy taxes because they were all made in France. All the furs were real. That was all chinchilla. Those were sables. They took the jewelry. Everything was burnt. The shoes, everything was burned. And then they would bring in all the costumes for the new show. All those beautiful thousands of dollars worth of feathers. You know, now you see a girl, she's got on some cheaper feathers with some ex couple expensive feathers. But they were all before, all, fe all the feathers were, you know, $20 a piece. And they'd be, they were just, I think, if you want to still see a Vegas show, go to Jubilee. It is just beautiful, and it's the last show. It's, it's not as glorious as it was at the Dunes or the Tropicana or the Stardust, but it's a, it's a great show. One, one last question. How do you feel when you look back and you The first, I worked at the Riviera twice, 57 and 59. I went to the Tropicana, then I lose track. I went to the Sands where I was fired the day I started. They fired the entire line of Copa girls. So I was the first nude and the last Copa girl. And uh, I seem to have done a lot of strange things first and last. And then uh, I was at the frontier where I beat up the security guard and got fired. Uh, the dunes, and I think that was about it. The dunes, 
under Sid Wyman and, and George Duckworth was probably the finest hotel I ever worked for. I loved the people at the Tropicana, but nobody was like they were at the Dunes. They were just amazing. How are we doing on time here? We got a few more questions we can take. Any more? If not, um, <laughs> Thank you, guys. And I, I, I want to take a second. Before, before I, I just want to say thank um, you first. The American uh, Numismatic Association would like to award Lisa Medford and Jingle Branson oh my their gosh. little educational certificate for presenting. Uh, and I know you all know that Lisa has a booth uh, in the showroom. And I got to tell mm -hmm. you, folks. <laughs> oh yes. Okay. Where is it? Okay. You just want to play with my chip. Yeah, you're right. It's a $100 uh, chip. The Riviera made a $100 chip in honor of the 50th anniversary. 50 years. 50 years. And it is at the Riviera. Lisa doesn't get any money for this. And it has three of the showgirls on it. And what Lisa talked about today, it's one one hundredth of what's in the book. And Chris and I have heard stories that I'm not sure Lisa is ever going to be able to put in the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Lisa and Gina thank are here you. for a while. So if you have personal questions, you want to